Good evening, everyone. It's fantastic to be here tonight. Um, it's great uh, to be in my sister's home state of Missouri. And uh, my sister, Mary Jo, is here. She's a professor at the University of Missouri, Columbia. So I'm a professor at, a at the medical school at the University of Washington. And no medical school professor would ever start a lecture without a handout. <laughs> and so I have, I have, on your chairs, you will have found a handout. It's only about this big. So I, it's a slight, something you, something, a little demonstration, and something that I would like you to take home with you. That um, if you take that home with you, even if I don't say anything that's comprehensible for the rest of the evening, <laughs> you'll honestly, when somebody says, well, how was that lecture tonight, last night, or whatever? You'll be able to say, I took something away from it. <laughs> so, so that when we walk through the world, we have this sense that when you look at something, that you actually have a perfectly accurate representation of the outside world inside of our heads. And Kind of as a demonstration to think about that a little bit, this is the interactive part of our program. So what I'd like you to all, if this is a you do what I do thing. So put your hands out like this with your thumbs down like this. And then once they're, you're both your thumbs and your backs are again, and then cross your hands like this and put your thing. So now your thumbs, your thumbs are down like this and your hands are crossed. Everybody. <laughs> Okay, now if you look, when you cross your arms like this, the interesting thing is that it's, it's almost impossible to turn your arms very far. So like this is an exercise in flexibility now. So you can turn them this way. How many people can get it so your hands are completely flat like that? Some people, some people. Okay, how many of you can do this? <laughs> now is that amazing? All right, great. So, so far, you've taken something away from it, and you've been amazed. So things are going pretty well. So what's really amazing is our perceptual system. And the reason that you're amazed at this particular thing is that you think that we're all doing the same thing. Your perception is that I'm doing the same thing you are, and so now when I can suddenly do something you can't, it seems amazing. And on your handout, I have some other things that are kind of similar along that same theme. One of them is this is one of my favorite kind of color illusions, that all the colors that are in this part are the same as these colors over here. But you see this is being orange, and this is being red, this being light green, and this being kind of blue-green. And the whole thing is, is that you don't see the actual color of these red stripes as being the same as those, because your visual system is taking information in from outside of that stripe in order to tell you something about the color of it. Here's another one of my very favorite demonstrations about a thing that's like this. You know, would it be possible to maybe just turn off the, the spotlight up there so that we could see the, the screen a little bit better or turn it to the side? Oh, yeah, that's much better. Now, this is, it actually even works better in real life on your thing, but I think now you'll be able to see. So, I call this a footprint, but down here and here, I see a foot bump. Who, who sees something like that? Yeah. Now, what, so what I want you to do is take, just pick this foot bump and, and watch it. And I'm now going to turn, turn the, the footprints around, but keep your eye on it, foot bump. It goes around like that. <laughs> now. <laughs> So you may still see it as a bump, but if you look away, you might see it as a print. So what's happening here is that this has to do with color, that because this is yellow right here, you think it's illuminated by the sun that, you're, that we've been trained to think is overhead. And that means if the sun's overhead, the only way this could be reflecting if it's a, a print. But I actually took this exact footprint and I just rotated it around, and these are identical images, actually. And so what happens then is that 
even though these produce exactly the same image on your retina in every way, that information that you have from the outside of the world is used to construct a percept that even tells you something about the three-dimensionality of you know, these images. So really what we learn here is that we're not just you know, having a video of the world around us, but everything that we see is actually constructed by our brain. So the lesson we learn then is that the visual system does not simply record a scene passively as a camera does. Rather, perception is a creative process. Patterns of light on the retina are transformed into a coherent interpretation of the 3D world. Our brain attaches meaning to the percepts it creates, and we use these in decisions about our actions. So a theme of my talk tonight is that knowing that our internal representation of the world around us is actually created by our nervous system raises the question of how we might manipulate our visual system to change how we perceive the world. One example that I'm going to talk about tonight is with the advent of gene therapy, this offers the possibility of manipulating the physiology of the visual system to do things like cure blindness. So, um, you know, this whole idea of the interaction between science and art is a favorite theme of mine. And um, so that's one of the things that I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight, too. Now, understanding how our brain works requires a spectrum of knowledge, from understanding the nature of the physical stimulus that produces particular responses inside of us, to understanding the molecular and cellular mechanisms that underlie those responses. And over the course of human history, through painting and drawing, artists were the first to explore the relationship between the physical stimulus and our perceptions. More recently, understanding how we see has been the business of both artists and scientists. So in our laboratory, we really use color vision as a model to understand perception more generally. An interesting thing about color vision is that there are infinite number of different wavelengths, and they exist in an infinite number of different combinations. And this infinite variety is really the physical stimulus that underlies color. Um, but colors are nothing like, the colors in our brain are nothing like the physical stimulus. And the first person that I know of to write this down, he probably wasn't the first person to notice it, uh, of course, is Leonardo da, Vin da Vinci. And he said that actually there's not an infinite number of colors, that there's only six. And he said, and he called them the simple colors. He said that they're white, yellow, green, blue, red, and black. And this is exactly what we scientists believe today, that inside of our brain, that color is represented as these six colors. Now, da Vinci used these, uh, these colors very effectively in his painting. So here's uh, the, this beautiful Last Supper. And if we look closely here, we can see how he used um, green and red, blue and yellow, black and white so beautifully to make a beautiful painting, one that evokes strong emotions. But you know, it's interesting that what's so magical about this painting is not here in the paint and the plaster, because that's all the painting is, is just paint and plaster. But um, it's in the fact that our visual system reconstructs what's represented up here into something that has great meaning to us. And the other magic, of course, is the genius of the artist who knows, knows how to manipulate the paint and plaster in order to evoke these very strong um, percepts and emotions inside of us. Well, this whole theme of that there are six colors, blue and yellow, red and green, is something that's been used through the, the history of art. And here's a Van Gogh. And it's not just you know Europeans, but here's say a uh, Chinese temple roof where you see the same colors. And even in modern times, here as these Bangladeshis celebrate 40 years of independence, you can see the same red and green, blue and yellow, black and white. So there are six color sensations. Two of them are not hues. There's black and white. And then there's four hues. 
And those hues are red and green, blue and yellow. And, but in between those hues, like between blue and green, there's a whole kind of spectrum of blue-greens. And between yellow and red, there's oranges. So altogether, even though we have six basic colors and four basic hues, that altogether we can see, people that have normal color vision can see about 100 different gradations in hue. Well, one thing, trying to explain color vision to people has gotten a lot easier in recent years because people can know something about how color is reproduced. For instance, most people know that in order to make a full color digital camera, that the, the camera actually has an array of three different kinds of sensors. And those sensors, there's one most sensitive to red, one most sensitive to green, and one most sensitive to blue. Now, there's nothing about the physics of the world that makes it like that. The reason that you have to have a camera made like that is because inside of our eye, there's three different kinds of sensors. There's one most sensitive to green, one most sensitive to blue, and one most sensitive to red. Now this is just a cartoon drawing of what it would be like, like if we could get a microscopic image of our retina and just look at the mosaic of the different kinds of color receptors on the back of our eye. And so this is the image is made up of you know, many, many of these different cone photoreceptors. Now inside the camera, everything was laid out almost geometrically, but you know, this is a piece of biology, so the red and green cones are kind of randomly intermixed. And interesting to include, only about 5% of the cones are blue cones. And you'd think, well, maybe that would mean we don't, wouldn't see as much blue in the world. But there's something about our brain that kind of amplifies the blueness. So you get by and see perfectly good color vision with uh, only 5% blue cones. So if we had a sensor that only had one, one, the, one kind, you know, then everything would be black and white. But with one sensor, it, you don't just get one sensation. You actually get two sensations, because the sensor could be either on or off. So you can get two different, you get one sensation for being on, white, and another sensation for when it's off, and you get black. And inside of our visual system, it's even more sophisticated than that, because our visual system has a way where it actually looks at contrast at different regions in the scene. So, those little dots that I was showing of, photo, of the photoreceptors are actually kind of long, skinny cells that communicate with neurons that send information to our brain. But inside of our retina, actually, a individual photoreceptor compares the number of photons that it's catching with what its neighbors are catching. And then those get subtracted. And so what happens is that a cone photoreceptor, it can communicate gee whiz, if I'm seeing lots of light, but around me, it, my other photoreceptor neighbors are not seeing very much light, it must be white. But if they're, they're the, right where I, where the spot that I'm seeing, and on the other hand, if all my neighbors are seeing lots of light, but I'm not seeing very much, it must be black. And what happens then, this is, this is supposed to be a drawing of a cone photoreceptor, and every single cone photoreceptor in the center part of our eye communicates with two neurons. And this one has, one of them has a sign reversing synapse. And so this cone, in one way, fires, this neuron right here fires when there's more light cut by the center cone. This one, when there's more in the surround. And so when this one fires, you say white. This one fires, you say black. And so you actually get two different sensations from a single cone photoreceptor. Well, um, so people that, there are, not everybody has trichromatic color vision based on three different kinds of cones. There are people in the population that are missing one population of cones. And we call these people red-green colorblind. And in the most severe forms of red-green colorblindness, they, those people strictly have two kinds of cones instead of three. Now, the marvelous thing is, is that they're not missing any of the cones. It's just the cones that would have been the population of red and green cones, in this particular case, are all just green cones. So there's nothing wrong with someone that's colorblind. 
they're not missing any receptors. It's just that instead of having two types, they only have a single type. And what happens when you're red-green colorblind is instead of seeing four different hues, you only have two hues. At one end of the spectrum, where we used to see red and green and orange and so forth, you see one color. I like to say it's yellow. <laughs> and at the other end of the spectrum, where we have purple and blue and everything for everyone else, you know, there's another color. We'd like to call it blue. Um, and so here's kind of my illustration of what color vision is like when you have different numbers of receptors. If you only have one kind of receptor, and this is the box of crayons, and it turns out that if you get the big box, it's like 96 crayons these days. And so, uh, but you see that really, if you didn't have any color vision at all, you don't really need 96 crayons. You know, one, one is good enough. But interestingly, when you add another photoreceptor, that it only gives you these two more sensations. So everything is shades of black and white and blue and yellow. And so if you're red, green, colorblind, you might think that if you're missing a third of your receptors, you'd have two thirds of your color vision left. But really, you know, if you are red, green, colorblind, you don't need 96 crayons. You really only need three. Because the page you're going to draw on is white. You don't need that. And, uh, but you need a blue, a blue crayon, a yellow crayon, and a, probably a black crayon. And even you think, well, wait, there's some white crayons on, in here. But there's something magical what happens when you add that third receptor. Every time you add a receptor, you add two new sensations. So we added a, a second receptor. We went from black and white. We added blue and yellow. What happens when we add the third receptor, we get two new sensations, red and green. And there's something magical about the number three, because now the colors red and green get added in different combinations to all those different colors. And suddenly, the full spectrum you know, of 100 different colors now comes open to us. So um, the there's a huge difference. And actually, among all mammals, the only ones that have red-green color vision are primates. So you can see what a marvelous innovation it was. So in our laboratory, we're interested in discovering the neurophysiology underlying perception and finding ways to use that information to better the human condition, as I said, as including the potential of restoring sight to the blind. Well, this isn't the first time in history that somebody thought about restoring sight to the blind. Actually, 250 years ago, the first cataract surgeries were performed where the lens that was defective was actually removed. And there are people, here's this, this painting by Pablo Picasso, and it shows a woman with a unilateral cataract. And sometimes people will get this where they actually are born with a cataract in one eye. And if they live their whole life like this, where they've never been able to see out this eye, you know, years ago people said, oh, I have this marvelous new technique. I'm going to remove that cataract, and I'm going to restore vision in your blind eye. And that was done, but it turns out it didn't restore vision at all. And so even that, though there's completely clear light going to the back of the eye, and you could put glasses on somebody, they could make a clear image, there was absolutely no vision in that eye that had never seen something. And the reason is, it's because your two eyes communicate in the brain, and the region, of the, if the region of the brain that's supposed to get information, one eye doesn't get it, the other eye completely takes over that brain territory. And the, this eye that had the cataract actually doesn't communicate with the brain. So one of the questions, so this kind of discouraged people about the idea of restoring sight in the blind. And this idea of you know, not being able to see out of one eye is called monocular deprivation. And so, but it's only one example, and we kind of know that there's competition between the two eyes. Maybe not everything where you would get deprived of some sort of vision would be something where you'd be blind if you tried to correct it. And so we'd like to know something about whether this monocular deprivation, is this kind of an exception, or is it a rule for this kind of thing? And so in order to explore this kind of thing, we wanted to do experiments in primates 
The reason is, is because ultimately we'd like to move this technology to people, and really the best model for human beings are uh, non-human primates. And the other thing is, is it's not a matter of whether we can make the sensors in our eyes suddenly sensitive to something they weren't sensitive to before. It's a matter of whether or not you restore vision. And so we wanted to be able to do something where we would be able to test vision in monkeys exactly in the same way that we test it in human beings. And so we'd be able to do an almost identical test that you could do in people. And so for that reason, well, first of all, there isn't any blinding disorder that's the perfect model in monkeys. The reason is, is in the wild, blind monkeys don't survive to reproduce so that there's no kind of genetic disorders that are very seriously blinding found in monkeys. But it turns out that um, there are a group of monkeys that have red-green color blindness, just like humans do. Now, you've probably all heard that dogs are colorblind, and there's many other mammals that are colorblind, but we're not looking for that. We want to have something where some of the individuals have trichromatic color vision, like a normal person does, but under other individuals, you know, have red-green color blindness. And in a particular group of monkeys from South America, that is exactly true. So a monkey may be red-green colorblind, but his sister might have normal color vision. So, and these beautiful animals from South America, and here is this painting from Frida Kahlo, um, and these happen to be a particular species of South American monkey, spider monkeys, and they're not, they're closely related to the animals that we work with, which are squirrel monkeys. Now, you may think that Frida Kahlo kind of made this whole thing up, that these are such friendly little animals and they come up and hang out with you like this, but oh no, it's true. <laughs> so, this is not me in the laboratory. This is me at, a, at an echo resort in Brazil on the Amazon, and these monkeys get fed every day, and you can see like there's a monkey right up there, and so they're kind of waiting, and you walk by, and you can see I'm wearing a backpack. And the monkey sees somebody walk by with a backpack, and they say, hmm, I wonder what he has that's good to eat back there. So they jump down and take a little ride and try to get, unzip your backpack and see what's interesting in there. But they are beautiful, friendly little animals that we just love them. So here are these fantastic animals that not only are they a great model for experiments, but they're just really, they're like our little children. But in order to get to the monkeys, I have to step back in evolution a little bit. That, so we have to go back a long way to fish, to kind of understand something about how our visual system works. Now, this is kind of looking into the head of a shark. And this right here, this is a cerebellum. And this part right here is the little tiny brain of the shark, a portion of their brain, that's involved in vision. And these are the huge eyes that the shark has. Now it turns out that this little part of the brain here, it only really has one function for a fish like this. And that is that it guides their movements. And so that they use their visual system in order to be able to steer themselves around, avoid objects, and chase after things that might be tasty. But there's this whole other part of their brain that we're gonna add right here. And so there is the part we were looking at concerned with vision. There's kind of a little connection, but almost a completely separate part of the brain right here. And then you see these. These is the olfactory nerves. And this is the olfactory epithelium. So that these is what the animal use, uses to smell with. And you can see that I said their eyes are huge. But look at the size of these olfactory, these are the olfactory bulbs, and then this huge olfactory epithelium. So, but their whole brain, they kind of have eyes, they're doing one thing, and uh, their olfactory system is doing a completely different thing. So, in animals and in evolution, the olfactory system was concerned with the identification of things enabling the organism to classify, attach meaning, and establish causal relationships among objects. So the way a fish works is it uses its eyes and it steers itself around and it gets to some place and then it uses its sense of smell to figure out what it is. So it smells blood in the water, oh, it's something to eat. It smells, 
one of its, uh, you know, it's gotten into the territory of another fish, you know, and it can smell that, ah, I'm somewhere I shouldn't be. But all the things where it's trying to attach meaning to the world comes from its olfactory system, and it really uses its eyes only kind of a way to steer itself around, steer its olfactory system around in order to find meaning in the world. And so you can see that, you know, this system back here, there's these beautiful eye muscles that are almost exactly like our eye muscles, used to steer the eyes. So the system does that, and of course, it guides all the movements that, and then, you know, separated from that is this part of the brain here that has to do with our sense of smell. And the visual system then in these animals is concerned with moment to moment information about a goal object. It's responsible for the programming and online control of particular movements. And actually, we are like this a fair amount of the time. I'm walking along, talking to my friend. You know, maybe we'll walk for an hour. And the whole time, my visual system is making sure that I step in the right place and you know, steer myself around. And I never think about the fact that I'm using my visual system to guide my motions. And um, so we actually have this aspect of our, our visual brain as well. And here you can see how well separated these are the olfactory bulbs here and the olfactory part of our brain and then the visual part of the brain. Well, over the period of evolution, here's a bunch of different, this is actually a different kind of shark, but this little kind of light blue area, that's the olfactory part of the brain. And then back here, this part here that's in darker blue, that's the visual part of the brain. But what happened in mammals is that ultimately you get up here, and the part that old time guiding mo motion visual part of the brain, it's just really small still. But this whole olfactory part of the brain in mammals is huge. And we call that part our visual cortex, and that's what we think of as being as our brain. Somebody says, what's your brain? It's really this cortex that all came about from, originally evolved from part of a brain that's involved with a sense of smell. Now, this is a brain of a rabbit, and um, this now shows the region of the brain that's involved in the ancient kind of smell system. And, in, and this is in a monkey, so the color-carded regions are right here, and they kind of get relegated. What's happened in human beings is that we get this huge frontal part of our brain that's all about decision making. And then in humans, you get these region down here. This is all what originally would have been involved in the sense of smell um, in lower animals. And you know, I go down every morning to the beach with my dog, and you know, the dog runs along, and all of a sudden, you know, steering itself along, running after things, but then suddenly it stops because it wants to know what something is. Suddenly its nose goes down to the ground. <laughs> you know, because it's doing the same thing. It's really trying to evaluate the meaning of things using its sense of smell. Well, what's interesting is that you know, there's been clinical cases where people found that people would have a particular kind of damage to a cortical region where they would lose their sense of color. And um, that people call this deficit achromatopsia. And people that have that, the visual world appears perfectly colorless. And so what people have said is what happens, there's actually damage to a part of our brain that's just concerned with seeing color. And Oliver Sacks wrote uh, a, a beautiful story about a colorblind painter. And the colorblind painter's name in the Sacks books, Mr. I. And Mr. I looked around at the world after he had this damage to his cortex. And he said that everything looked like it was made out of lead. And he made this image where these are the object he tried to show what the world looks like to him. And then he purposely got somebody that could see color <laughs> to help him put this nice picture of an orange in there to contrast what his visual world was like compared to um, everyone else's. Well, interestingly, that the place where this person had the lesion was down here in the temporal lobe that we were just looking at. That's the part that was inherited from the smell system from other animals. And actually, here is kind of an inflated version of it that shows you down inside the folds. And there's lots of cortex here. And this is the cortex 
that um, is the color center. But that we but it's been given the name that comes from uh, comparative biology. It's called the perirhinal cortex. That means around the nose. And so this part of the cortex that receives uh, a majority of its input from high level visual areas, including our sense of color, but in lower animals, its inputs are primarily olfactory. So the amazing property of olfactory cortex is its association with the parts of brain that are concerned with memory. This is because the identification of objects and the ability to classify them and attach meaning to them requires memory. So it turns out that we don't just have one color vision system. We have kind of an ancient color vision that's used system that's used to steer us around. And so here's your cone photoreceptors. And even in our visual system, we have these specialized cells in the retina that eventually send information out to these cells that eventually send out an axon that goes to our brain. And there's a couple of different kinds of cells here that send information about color to parts of their brain that are involved in movement. But the thing that happened in primates, oh, that, um, and, and this is what we inherited from the fishes. So these fish probably don't go and say, oh, that's such a lovely fish in front of me, and what a bright, beautiful tail he has. They don't care about that. They just know in order to stay alive, they better stay in the school. And in order to be able to follow the fish in front of them, they have to have good high contrast so they don't lose that guy in front of them, even if they get into kind of foggy water. And they probably have no perception of color from this at all. They're just using this to drive their movements that allow them to stay into the school. But if you look at lots of fish, that they have these yellow tails that are signals to the guy behind them to tell them how to make the right movements to stay up so you don't get eaten. So, but in primates, actually, there's evolved a whole other circuit inside of our retina where there's a single connection to individual cones, including the red cones, the green cones, and the blue cones that carry information out of our brain to that part of our brain that used to be involved in olfaction, but now is involved with a completely different kind of color vision that's involved with kind of a conscious perception of color, where we can assign meaning to color. And that's kind of what brings us to an exhibit like this, because we go and all these different colors are so beautiful to us, and you know, we attach these wonderful meanings, what's your favorite color? You know, all of these things come about because of this very recently evolved sense where we attach meaning to color. So here's what we were thinking, that in an ancient primate, before red-green color vision evolved, that there would have been a system that where you kind of have you know, a green cone here, and all the cones around it are green. And depending on whether it goes to design inverting synapse or not, these cells give you black and white. But then there's other, we call it receptive fields, where this photoreceptor has a blue cone next to it, and this one has a blue. But they go through different kinds of synapses. So in this particular case, when the surround containing that blue cone is more active, the person says, oh, blue. And here, when the center is more active, they say, oh, yellow. And so this is how you get four of your sensations, black and white, blue and yellow. So we thought, well, gee whiz, maybe the way the color vision evolved is you just sprinkle in some more receptors. In this case, you add some red ones. And now you get same black and white. And these have red cones in the center. So you get two kinds, because they go through those two channels on and off the black and white ones, but in this case, they're now blue and yellow. But now, occasionally, you have ones where there'll be a green cone in the center, and that's what gives you the two more colors, red and green. And we said, since it's so simple, and then it goes to that part of your brain that's so good at learning and memory, we'll just, we could sprinkle the retina with a bunch of different kinds of cones. It would go to the right place in the brain already, and it goes to the special part that kind of could learn a new meaning to these different things, and we could restore color vision in a colorblind person. So that brings us to the possibility of curing humans, color blindness in humans. And our approach is to pick out the monkeys that have blue cones and green cones, but no red cones. So we genetically tested them beforehand. And then 
because we wanted to ultimately prove that you could do this in people, we got a gene for a human red photopigment. We packaged it into a viral vector, and then we injected it into the eye of monkeys. Now, the photoreceptors are actually at the back of the eye behind the retina. So in order to do this particular technique, you have to go in through the eye to the back here and make a little injection underneath the retina. And this is done by a vitro retinal surgeon. And once he does one little spot like that, then he moves the needle and makes another spot and another spot. So he kind of covers the whole entire back of the eye with this gene therapy treatment. But the wonderful thing oh, I, about it is that we don't want to turn all, what we, what we want to do is turn the green, some subset of the green cones into red cones. But we don't want to turn all the green cones into red cones because then we just have a different form of color blindness. But we want to take advantage of the fact that the viral vector only kind of randomly, you know, infects a random set of cone four receptors. So if we can adjust the dosage, we can kind of get a sprinkling of green cones that are converted to red and get a mosaic of red and green cones just like a normal person has. Well, we developed this electrophysiological technique to see whether or not the animals got red sensitivity. And this is a big display that there's a thousand red LEDs and then a thousand green ones turn on and it goes back and forth in a special sequence that allows us to tell us, figure out exactly what part of the eye the signal is coming from. And then we do a calculation to see the different parts of the retina that were exposed to that. You know, are there parts that are more sensitive to red light? And each, this particular color I'm showing you says is the color you get when there's no sensitivity to red light. So this is what the diagnostic looks like before these animals were treated. And then this is what they look like after it was treated. So these are the locations. These rough spots are kind of the locations right here, here, and here where the injections were made. And then here's where we transformed the retina, you know, so it didn't have any sensitivity to red light. And so we got a huge area of the retina back here that was treated and now got red light sensitivity. And we like to measure how much of the retina is treated in visual degrees of visual angle. And our whole visual angle is about 180 degrees, but across this whole retina here is about 150 degrees. We get at least 130 degrees. So, you know, we get a big part of our visual field has been treated, or the monkey's visual field has been treated with this technique. So, as I said, I wasn't too surprised. I kind of knew we'd be able to transform a subset of the cones from green to red. But what does this do to the animal's vision? And these monkeys were colorblind from birth. And the ability to extract trichromatic coloration requires specialized neural circuits, as we've talked about, to segregate and compare the outputs from a mosaic of three different kinds of cones. So the question is, does changing the retina in the way we did confer a new visual capacity? I also told you at the beginning that we wanted to have a color vision test that was just like you could do on humans. Now, back in the back room, you could see lots of different kinds of color vision tests. And the way that they work is there's a bunch of dots. And then hidden in those dots, back there are numbers, are letters. And if you can see the difference between the colors that makes up the numbers in the background, then you, you, know, you can tell, say there's a number. Well, the monkeys, they weren't so good at learning their numbers. <laughs> but so we got an actual computerized color vision test that's used to test human. And we got the people to help us turn it into a monkey test. So now instead of a number or something, there's just a blob. And, but the blob can move around on the screen to here in this case. And we can make it really dim. We can change the color. And so here it's really, really faint. So we can measure their threshold for color vision. And so we can measure color vision by having the monkey touch the screen where he sees a place where it looks different in color. And everybody says, well, wait a minute. <laughs> well, you have colorblind monkeys, and you're training them to do a color vision test. How does that work? Well, 
The answer is, is that they have blue-yellow color vision. They can see blue and yellow from grays. And so we can actually train them to do a color vision test by showing colors that are blue and yellow that they can see is different from the background. Now, the other thing is, is that real colorblind humans and colorblind monkeys, they see a slightly different color, blue and yellow, than a normal person does. And so the color I'm going to show you looks kind of yellowish green, but it's the perfect yellow, both for normal, normal colorblind people <laughs> and, the, and these colorblind monkeys. And so they get, they get to be extremely good at this. So I have to turn on the sound because we, we communicate with the monkeys through a sound. Okay, that, that's yellow to the monkey. Uh, but I didn't say they touch with their nose. <laughs> but, and do you hear that clicking sound? So what, every time the monkey touches and gets right, he gets a clicking sound. And that tells him, good job. And you got it right. And then under each one, each of the places he can get it correct, there's a little well and a little tiny drop of white grape juice appears when he gets it right. And so he hears that sound, and then he knows right away that he can get that grape juice. And some of the animals actually do touch with their hands, but it turns out to be very inefficient. It's much more efficient. Put your nose there, touch, and then down for your drink, and you can go a lot <laughs> faster. So, but we had to test the animals to see if they were colorblind or not. We knew they were, but we have to demonstrate it because otherwise it wouldn't be very impressive if we said we now cured them. So, but the thing you have to appreciate is that there is a color that's red and a color that's green, but these animals don't have red and green as colors. To them, there's a perfect red and a perfect green that looks absolutely gray. And so when they see a stimulus like this, and there's a color right here, if it's exactly the right color, when the poor animal looks, and we've developed a digital process that we can kind of show you exactly the way the world looks to a colorblind human or colorblind monkey. And so this is the way the display looks when there's that red dot up there to the animal. There's nothing. And this is actually the way a monkey looks to another colorblind monkey as well. The, and so they've learned, as soon as that screen pops up, that we're it's just like a person. Well, they know, what do you see here? And they look and they go, I don't see anything. You know, they go, well, touch something. And they, they get very frustrated. So in the real world, what we do is we give them the blue ones and the yellow ones, and then we sneak in the red and green ones so we can test them on those. But just for your viewing pleasure, I'm going to show you you know, a series where we only show them the colors that they can't see. So you have to appreciate the fact that, you know, we can see something right here, but the monkey sees nothing right there. And so he looks at this and he sees absolutely nothing. And so when he gets it wrong, we give him a buzzer. And we give him a little bit of a time out. So it has to wait for a second. Occasionally, you know, like one out of three times, he can guess it correctly. But then he usually tries that one spot again. Oh, good, maybe that's where it is. I've had enough. I've had enough. <laughs> so what we did is we, we knew that people, when we said, oh, we did this experiment, if it really worked, that people would be extremely skeptical. I'll plug it in one more time for the last thing, but it just hums a little bit. The, so what we did is we actually ran these animals in this color vision test every single day for a year and a half. And because we were, people said, well, there, you know, your color vision test is imperfect and there's some hidden cues in there that they learn after a long period of time. So they really didn't, you know, 
There's no difference. We didn't do anything to him. So he did over a year and a half. And so this is a graph that shows the results of three different color vision tests that are six months apart. And up here, this is the test on the, these are green colors, the ones they can't see. And these are yellow colors they don't see. And this is threshold. How far away does it have to be from gray before they see it? And so it doesn't have to be very far from gray, and they can see it when it's this yellow color. And this is actually a logarithmic scale. And the animal never actually sees it. But we can calculate theoretically, if we could make a color that was that colored, how far away would it have to be? It'd have to be here, you know, you know, 10 log units greater in, in saturation. And so, so we showed that they never get any better. A year and a half, every morning, we wake them up. Before they have breakfast, we test their color vision. Never get any better. Well, so then this is where we treated the animals. And we treated them in both eyes. And this is the results just for one animal. Well, we'd done some preliminary experiments. And we found an amazing thing. We do the injection. And the animals don't suddenly get that new sensitivity right away. It takes 20 weeks for the new gene to turn on. And I, we're still a little surprised by that, but the photoreceptors, you only get one set of photoreceptors your entire life. And so we say they're post-mitotic. You know, these animals were about five years old. They hadn't turned on a new gene in five years. And so you have to upregulate this, this kind of turn on a new gene machinery. And the, actually, a piece of DNA we put in is single stratted, so they have to make a second strand. So it takes a little while. So, after the injection, the animals really didn't get any better. And then we kind of patiently waited. But that's what we do in science. You know, we keep testing them, waking them up every morning. And, but then there is this time came when we already knew from previous experiments that the genes now turned on the new thing. And so it was amazing what happened is that the animals had this dramatic change in their color vision. And so ultimately, they were able to see red and green almost as well as they can see blue and yellow. But after the gene turned on, they had a very quick change in their, their vision. Well, there's, I'm a scientist, so I have to show a graph. But um, really, what's uh, much nicer. So here's, here's Dalton after he's been treated. OK, sometimes he just gets off with his nose, but you can very clearly see that he looks. And you can make it really, really close to gray to measure his threshold. And you can see sometimes it gets really hard for us to see. But still, it's no problem for him. I couldn't even see that one, but he did. Um, <clears throat> so it was, you know, a, a great result. So this experience in which adult animals that were colorblind from birth gain a new visual capacity provides a counterpoint to the negative results obtained when a unilateral corneal opacity was corrected in an adult. Now, does what happen is that the world looked like this to the animal? And then he woke up one day, and all of a sudden, the world looked like this. Well, say people said, well, you could show, he showed that they can tell red from gray and green from gray, and they could do it right away. But wait a minute, can they tell red from green? We said, well, we actually haven't tried that. But it turns out that we can make the background green, and we make the dots red, and we can see whether they can tell red from green. And then, so we tested that. Sure enough, they can tell red from green. But they say, wait a minute, but can they tell yellow from green? Oh, we'll try it. So it turns out that when you do every possible test, that all the different discriminations that we can make, the animals make. So from everything we can measure, their color vision is exactly like somebody has normal color vision. But you know what? I think that right away, they could see that there was something different on the screen 
when it was red and green, but they probably hadn't attached meaning to it before, and they probably couldn't tell red from green right away. They're just like, something's tickling my brain just a little bit differently. And the reason that we see red and green as having such meaning is because we've learned that red is the color of wine, or lipsticks, or you know, scarlet dresses, you know, and we've attracted our blood. And so we've attached meaning over a long period of time. So I actually believe that, that ultimately the animals could see something different right away. But the meaning that takes on is something that the animals probably learned over a period of time. And we do go in and show the animals M&Ms and different things. And, but you know, one of the animals loves green. And so if I hold out, we're not supposed to give them M&Ms actually. But uh, I can't resist. You know, you hold out the M&Ms and he'll pick out the green ones, which he never did before. So I'd just like to close and say, so now we get lots of cards and letters and emails from people that, you know, tell me about all their experiences of what it's like to be colorblind. And so here's our process that we can take an image like of a sunset and show what it looks like to a colorblind person. So here's what it looks like to a colorblind person, but Here's what you see if you have normal color vision. So I got, I could spend the rest of the evening showing you examples, but I just have two. Well, here's the Tokyo subway. And <laughs> you want to go someplace in Tokyo, and they say, oh, it's simple. Just take the magenta line. A colorblind person is lost, but when you have normal color vision, you know, very simple would have where to find the magenta line. So, uh, you know, color really has tremendous meaning and use in our world. And so with that, I'll stop. Here's a picture from the University of Washington. And here is beautiful red and green, blue and yellow, black and white. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Raise your hand. I'll come by with a microphone. Uh, we're videotaping, as you can tell, uh, so we want to get the audio on the video, so be sure to hold the microphone close to your mouth. Otherwise, you won't be able to hear it. Yes, sir. Have you done anything to try and figure out how the brain first organizes w which sensors are detecting which colors? You know, it seems like they are kind of, one well, presumes they're randomly placed. Right. And that somehow the brain has to organize and say, oh, those are the red ones and those are the green ones. Is it some long experience or is it fairly short term? Or? Right. So, you know, in this, these ancient pathways that go to our motor movements, I think that there's actually special molecules that label the lines clear through to the place where the targets are. And so it's organized. And so if we wanted, if there was a blue, yellow, colorblind fish, we probably couldn't cure him. <laughs> but in the case of these pathways that go to, that come from this system, that actually each, each ganglion cell that has an optic nerve has a center that goes either to a blue cone, a red cone, or a green cone. And those go up to the brain, and each one is now maintaining the information from single kinds of cones. And so what I think that really is happening, it goes to this part of the brain that can learn that over time, you know, oh, gee whiz, I only fire under certain circumstances. And that the, uh, so you preserve the information about red, green, and blue, but you don't have any idea what those things are. And that over a period of time with experience, we attach meaning. And this is that in the whole evolution of the olfaction system, there's actually hundreds or maybe even thousands of different receptors. And the only way to sort it out is to really do it by learning. And that I think that we as, as primates have kind of used that for color vision. So we really have to probably sort it out by learning. And that's why part of the reason you know, we 
attach particular meaning to some colors and other cultures attach other meanings. And part of it's because, you know, there, I think there's a huge learning component. That's why ultimately if there is a time where we can actually try this in humans, though we can answer that question to see, you know, do they actually see colors at first and is it a process or does it suddenly turn on? Uh, mo infant monkeys? No, infant people. No. <laughs> so we're dedicated to developing gene therapy to treat all sorts of kind of human visual disorders. But, you know, for color blindness, the whole entire thing is we have to make it so we can do it with absolutely no risk. And we now have made huge progress on that. And, and so, but once we eventually feel like we're confident that we can do it and do no harm, then, then we'll think about doing it. No, I wasn't suggesting therapy. I was just wondering, have people tested infants or whether they are oh. able to distinguish colors as well as adults? Yes, that humans have been tested for color vision a lot and they have terrible color vision. That, um, and they don't, actually color is one of the last things to come in and even though once kids get to be six or seven years old and they go to preschool, people use color a lot in teaching, but younger children, they don't have meaning attached to colors that they do other things. And it's kind of amazing that they'll, they know, you know, train, truck, car, and then you show them two different colored things, like red, green, and they, they don't learn it. So that might be a hint that this whole learning thing, there's something to it. Uh, there, there's the other types of cones that exist in the animal world, mantis shrimp, butterflies. Uh, would they be perceiving something further range of the spectrum or would they be seeing other details within it? You hear about people that claim to be tetrachromates that have a fourth type of cone. H have you got any experimental data on that? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. So he asks, I mean, almost maybe everybody's heard about the fact that mantis ships, shrimp have uh, 12 different kinds of photoreceptors with different spectral sensitivities. Well, I don't think they have any conscious color vision at all. And actually in our eye, we have five different, all of us have that have normal color vision, have five different kinds of receptors with different spectral sensitivities because our rod photoreceptors that we use under dim light actually absorb light in a different region of the spectrum than any of the three cones. They're kind of in between the blue cones and the green cones. And then recently there have been these melanopsin ganglion cells that people may have heard of because they've been in the news that have to do with circadian rhythms. They have a totally different spectral sensitivity too, kind of in the blue, but not quite where our blues are. So if if we were just dissecting human beings and we took, took them out, we'd go, oh my God, look at, they have five different kinds of spectral photoreceptors. They must have pentachromatic color vision, but they don't. And I think part of it may be just a coincidence that they're using each of these receptors for different kinds of functions. And it just happened that they hit on some of them that have different spectral sensitivities, but they're not like extracting, you know, a whole different color sense, like we get a whole sense from having three kinds of receptors. But that said, they definitely have photoreceptors that are sensitive down in the ultraviolet range, way down in the ultraviolet. So they cover part of the spectrum, that, and we don't. And so they do have receptors in part of the spectrum where we can't see. Oh. Then I'll be back there, sir. Have you, te have you tested anybody um, to kind of see what happens with a synesthete as they are experiencing colors? <laughs> That's a great question. So synesthesia is a fascinating thing. And I probably get an email or a phone call from someone who has synesthesia every single day. <laughs> and um, they have these marvelous experiences where the most common thing is that they will see numbers, sometimes musical notes, and they'll see them as being a color. And, you know, it's actually 
interesting because that there's many of us that actually associate with colors with particular numbers. That it turns out like, I think three, if you go out and ask people, say three, what color is it? Like more than half the people will say orange. <laughs> Something like that. So, but anyway, that's the thing that people get a color sensation from seeing a number. And they say that they love looking in the phone book because it's very colorful. <laughs> But no, I'm, I, I'm really fascinated by that, but it turns out that, that color vision is the only part that took over this learning part of our brain, that you know, aspects of language are also localized to this kind of same region that has to do with learning. And I'd love to know what happens, but it's, this is just because it's all kind of going on. All of our modern things that we do that have to do with Learning and attaching meaning kind of have to do with this ancient part of the brain that has to do with learning. And something somehow gets crossed in those individuals. But I, I, every time somebody calls me and writes to me, I said, if you're ever in Seattle, here's my cell phone, give me a call, and well, but I haven't yet. Yeah, is there any, when, when you inject this gene therapy in the monkeys, is there some, uh, effect on the visual acuity? Do they get confused by it when that switches on or, or not? That's a great question. So that the, the question is, is that, you know, maybe we gave them more color vision, but we produced a decrement in some other aspect of their vision. And um, I have not been able to do super accurate acuity testing in these animals because of the way that we do the experiment. We can put up numbers and letters or little bars up on that screen and we can teach them just like we can this. But the problem is that the animals are unrestrained and so they get to get as close as they want. But in the simple things we've done, we don't see any evidence for any change in acuity. And well, of course, we do all these unscientific things. We go in the room, stand back far, hold up our finger and the animal doesn't do anything, hold up a peanut. <laughs> so, you know, everything we see, because we, we have exactly that concern. So we're actually developing some techniques where we can actually train the animal to rest its head in a chin cup like a person does. And so that they, and then we have them indicate, you know, with the movement, you know, what they see, so we can test that a little bit better. So, but that's something we'd like to know. But so far, I think they're okay. All right, due to the time, that'll, it's gonna have to be the last question. Thank you, Dr. Knights. And thank you for attending our exhibition opening and lecture tonight. The exhibition will be on display through March 14th, so come back several more times to view it. Our next lecture in the color series is November 7th. Neil Harbison, who was born with achromatopsia, complete color blindness, but he has a device, electronic device implanted in his head that allows him to hear colors. Tickets are going fast for that, so be sure to reserve your seat. And then November 21st, Steve Palmer from UC Berkeley will talk about the aesthetics of color preference. Thank you and good night.